Hi, Dr. Pelto. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some practice management tips for residents. And uh, this is uh, part two of a lecture that was given to some of the podiatry residents here. We're going to talk a little bit about electronic medical records. Uh, what to look for in an EMR. Okay, so it's good to look, uh, EMR is an electronic medical record. Uh, you should look at something that's easy to use in setting up templates and quick texts. What you're going to find uh, here on the on the bottom or in another place uh, here uh, is going to be some of the templates that I that I use. You can certainly download those. Let's explain the difference. A template is something that you make for a basic diagnosis. So you can do a diabetes template, an ingrown toenail template, and this is something that you use every time, and it usually auto populates some of the normal values. It's really important to set these up so you don't have to do a lot of clicking every time. It pulls in all the normal, and all you do is change the abnormal. Quick texts are called macros. It's basically any phrase that you use in your discussion that you write over and over. If you have to write it more than three or four times, you should probably make a quick text out of it. And I've included as well uh, elsewhere here, you're gonna find the quick texts that I find that are that are helpful uh, for some of the common discussions about plantar fasciitis, about uh, first post-op visit, wounds, ulcers, all these discussions. It saves a lot of time. Then you can uh, edit them. Some people get concerned about using the same template all the time, but you can edit it and add in different words to it. So these pre-made templates, most of them have a billing component to it. And so these billing components, what they do is they take a percentage of about three to five percent or up to seven percent. There's different uh, percentages. Basically, it's the amount that you produce. They'll take a percentage of that to give you the nice front end of uh, electronic medical record. There are different types. Some of them are online. The majority are online, and then they just take a percentage. Some are still server-based, and you pay for updates as they come along. They're, they're constantly changing. It's good to have a version that can be used both for desktop and mobile. Uh, the mobile is a little bit lighter, but you can still kind of look at patient's notes. Uh, the mobile isn't as in-depth, but with most phones, you can look at the desktop version on the mobile phone. It's just a little bit bigger, so you have to move around to do different things. There are certain restrictions you can't do. One other thing that really helpful is having integrated MRI results. So from the MRI, they'll auto-post to your um, medical record, and there's usually a link, a PAX link to look at the EMR, uh, the MRI results, the lab results. It's also important to have uh, integrated uh, prescriptions for like narcotics. And usually with that work, you do it through your medical record. And then they give you a little app, a Norton app on your phone and it has a little code. And based on that, if you put that code in along with your password, it'll allow you to do schedule two narcotics. Uh, otherwise you won't be able to do that through your medical record. You have to write them by hand. Looking at security standards, uh, the importance of support. I find that support helps the first six months, but after that, there's not much support for most of these. Billing and coding uh, as well. For uh, Look for uh, something that has that integrated, meaning the billing component can be integrated within the medical record. Some people, uh, because of that, they can reduce some staff that used to do billing in the office. We thought we could do that. We had two billers. We went down to one biller. Uh, but we still needed a biller. One option that we did, we actually outsourced, outsourced our billing. So it saved of having someone in-house. You could find an out, outsourced person that does the billing. And basically, they just kind of review the notes, review how you're billing it, and send it, send it to the clearing house. Unless you're really good at billing and you want to do that yourself, uh, you can save some money that way. But it's, it's uh, relatively inexpensive. And I think it's better to have someone outside because they are doing multiple offices and you don't have to pay the other overhead. A good resource is the APMA coding resource. That's APMACodingGRC.org. It's, uh, it's really the best coding resource, and it explains how you should be coding, what different codes you should use for procedures, for diagnosis. It has kind of cross uh, understanding between ICD-9 and ICD-10, different types of codes. There's also some, some good coding seminars that you could go to from ACFAST, APMA. Uh, as much as you can learn about coding, it's going to make your job easier because you, you, when you finish, you just can't say, well, I didn't understand. You need to understand coding. If you ever uh, get audited, which, which all of us will get audited, you have to know uh, some information about coding. There was a question one of the residents had, should I be a DME provider or durable medical equipment provider? In, in private and group practice, okay, private practice by yourself or a group of same 
specialty like podiatry, it brings more revenue into the office. So it's usually a good idea as long as you have staff that can help. You need to be careful. There are a lot of rules that need to be followed. Something called DME standards. You have to give certain paperwork. You have to guarantee. You have to post your hours of service. You have to have documentation. Many people I find, though, they have high deductibles these days, and so I send some people to Amazon. So with Amazon, just so you know, you can make an Amazon influencer page, and it's a page where you can send them, and you do get 1% or 2%. It's not really for the money that you get paid for it. Um, at this point, I think I make like $10 a month. It's, it's not about that. It's, it's, it's about putting everything in one location for your patients based on diagnosis. So if you want to see mine, I'll put a little link here. You can find that my Amazon page, and I do it based on you know plantar fasciitis, um, warts, or other other things. You're already sending them out to purchase. If you can't provide it in your office, a lot of things you can, and you can make sure they get something good. But things that you can't provide, or they want to think about it, you can send them to that link to make sure they get the right product. Otherwise, people spend a lot of money and they don't get what's good. <clears throat> Uh, this next section is what I wish I knew when I was starting out. So I've been uh, in practice uh, at this point since 2009. And there are a lot of things that I wish I knew when I was starting out. So let's go here. Uh, about medical records, electronic medical records. Learn your EMR. When I first started, they said, oh, we're going to be switching to a new EMR. So don't worry about the one you have. And I was at a, as a, at a loss because I, I didn't learn it. I, I could have learned it. But they said, oh, we're going to switch it. So I didn't waste time, in my opinion, learning it. Uh, if you learn the EMR, uh, we were using many notes and we switched to something else. It made it a lot more difficult if I, because I didn't learn it. I didn't spend time to learn how to make templates, to learn how to make these quick texts that I talk about, to learn how all the nuances. And being a, a younger doctor, you can be valuable to the practice, especially if they are transitioning to a new medical record. By making all the templates, you make them, they'll come to you, you're a resource, and you're going to be more value for that practice. Make good templates and ask others for their templates. Once again, I'm going to provide my templates for you here. You can look at my templates. You're going to have to modify them based on your medical record. If you do decide on Athena and I'm still using it at that time, you can just send me an email and I'll give you access to mine. They'll just transfer them over so it'll be a lot easier. Make good macros. This was something that I didn't do in the beginning and I was typing, typing. Every time you type more than maybe a paragraph, you should be making that a, a macro so you can use it again. So I have uh, ingrown toenail, post-op one, post-op two. I have a, a wound, a wound follow-up, a wound heal. Everything that you're that continually happens, you can make a template out of it. It makes it a lot easier. And when you're making these templates, I think it's a good idea to copy and paste them into a Word document because you never know if you're going to be switching EMRs. And that's what I'm going to provide for you is this Word document. It's a running document that I just pretty much copied and pasted from the, from the EMR. Another good tip is try to finish notes every day. You may not have uh, a time to finish them in each patient encounter. If you can, that's great without losing the connection with the patient. That's the, the bad thing about uh, being in, in, in with, a, with a computer in front of the patient. You lose, use that, lose that interaction. Many people today are using scribes, whether it be a virtual scribe or an actual scribe in the room, which is one of your medical assistants that does the typing and you teach them to use the template. That helps to have greater interaction. Uh, and reduces the stress, reduces all these other things that you have to do. But if you are, are going to try to finish them that day, I recommend writing some key notes in the discussion, develop the templates, uh, and, and certain things that are more complex, like wounds. If you make a template with the size, depth, offloading, different types of treatments, it makes it much easier to document and even do the follow-up visits. Also, a, a pre-surgical discussion, talking about all the possible complications, gout discussions, just some examples of the templates that you're going to want to make. And if you want those, I'm going to be including them here for your reference. Uh, also, promoting yourself. When you start in a practice, instead of just um, receiving uh, patients from the practice, you may say, well, the practice is busy enough. I don't need to make a name for myself. It's really good to promote yourself because it shows value. It shows that you're a go-getter. Uh, getting involved in the community is important. Uh, get involved with what you enjoy. Okay, if you were a Boy Scout, get involved in, in Boy Scouts. Both me and my one of the other colleagues here were both Eagle Scouts. So you do helping with a merit badge or helping with something with Scouts. If, if you're a Rotary person, maybe, for example, I was a Rotary Exchange student, and so I have some contacts for them. You can do a, a, a talk for them. You can participate in their meetings. Chamber of Commerce, I think that's a good group to be involved in. Uh, a running club, if you like to run, a cooking club, BNI, which is 
Business uh, Networking International. It's a group that we pass business uh, amongst different professions. I was part of that for the first three or four years when I started to get to know different people. Toastmasters, if you like to do public speaking, these are all some of the ones that I tried. I tried BNI, Toastmasters, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, different things that you may you may like, but do what you enjoy. If you don't enjoy doing it, don't do it. And also, like anything, get involved. If you're not going to be involved, if you're not going to be committed to it, you probably shouldn't do it because you're not going to get many referrals from it. Also, I, I think it's important for you to become an authority. Um, even as a, a young doctor, find something that you like and then become an authority, whether it be running, whether it be wounds, whether it be a rear foot reconstruction surgery. And the way to become an authority is really to either write or produce content on that. So you may want to write an article, pretty easy to do, writing an article and post it as a blog. Uh, you may want to write a book, which is a little bit more ambitious, but a lot of times you can, you can write it and have someone else format it. I'll, I'll put some examples here of a plantar fasciitis book that I wrote. Basically, I wrote it in the downtime between patients. I've, wrote, I've written one on that, on wounds. And you use your downtime to, to write. You can either do multiple blogs that produce a book. That's one easy way, like each blog is a chapter. Or you can just write it. And then what I do is I recommend using a couple of outsourcing uh, virtual assistants to edit it. There's one called Fiverr, and they will edit it for you, and you pay them, it's like $5 for every 20 minutes, or another one is called Fancy Hands, and I'll put these links, these resources below. Fancy Hands is someone that you pay as a virtual assistant, and there's different people that can edit it. There are more specific ones, it depends on your needs, or I have a patient that he's a retired lawyer, and he likes to edit, and I send him a copy, and he edits it for him, and I give him, you know, a little, I don't know, I haven't really given him anything yet, but you could give him gift cards, you could give him different things. So you may find certain patients that are retired that want to be involved, and it's good to have someone non-podiatry read these books because they are, uh, they, you're going simpli to simplify it. And that's what's really hard when you're writing either articles or books or even public speaking because that's the other one on the list here. Because we talk at this level to podiatrists or to other professionals, and it's really hard to bring it down and simplify it. And if you look at my YouTube page, I try to really simplify it. And you may criticize it because, well, it's too simple. And some people have said you're not using the academic terms. But the general population, their understanding is even physicians is so low in terms of what we do, we need to simplify it and then bring them up. Uh, recording videos on YouTube is an easy thing for some people, blogging, but pick one and do it well. So basically, if you want to blog, blog, and then do it as a kind of a hub and spokes. So you have the hub and then all the spokes. So you, you either blog or you produce videos or something, and then you send it out to your Facebook, you send it out to your LinkedIn, you send it out to all your other resources online. It's very, very easy. If you go to YouTube, for example, and it says has a little share button, you can just share it to all your social media and it's very easy to do that. Uh, that's why I pick YouTube because it's easy to make videos. I have a little um, Logitech recorder here. I have a little microphone. I do videos and I post them and I make little thumbnails. It's pretty easy and I'll explain how to do all that throughout this information. Okay. Uh, connecting. I think it's important to connect with patients. One thing that I was taught uh, during residency was to call all patients after surgery, and that's something that I do. Uh, also, uh, call after procedures to see how they're doing. Like if I was just starting out, I would call everyone. Everyone I did a cortisone injection, everyone I did an ingrown toenail, because it shows that you care, because you do care, and you have more time in the beginning. Uh, you might want to keep a post-it note as a list of how to do that. As you get more involved and you're busier with life and have kids and, and other things like that, it gets more complex. So I use a very sophisticated reminder system, and I'll put some information about this as well. It's called followupthen.com. And basically what it is, you send an email to yourself, and then it will send you a text message at a certain time. So my surgical block is, is, is the, the second Wednesday of each month. And so what it does, the second Wednesday of each month at 5 p.m., it sends me a text message, tells me to call my patients. It's as a reminder because we get very busy. And in this follow-up, then I use this for everything. So I'll share that, that resource. It, it works great for connecting with patients, for reminding. Because people think, oh, he has a great memory. But every time I send an email, for example, to the residents or to others, I put like in the BCC or blind contact, I put one week at follow-up then, and it sends it back to me. So it, 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 it auto, automatically reminds me and keeps my email box too empty. Send cards for memorable occasions if, if, a, if a spouse dies or if there's a difficult time. My staff already knows to do that. They write it and I, and I sign it or I, I fill it out and they send it for me. Try to be memorable once again with phone calls, cards, 
helping family. It doesn't cost you anything if there's a family member in the room. Hey, let me look at your feet. Take off your shoes. Do you have any questions? Send me a picture. These little things mean a lot. Calling patients means a lot because many doctors don't do that. Be present. I think it's important to keep distractions to a minimum. I tell the residents not to have a cell phone with you because uh, you can get distracted. Even if you have that vibration, it's vibrating on your side, you are distracted. You're wondering who's trying to contact you. Everyone knows that they can't get a hold of me during the day on my cell phone. Even my wife, I tell her to call the office and then they interrupt me. So they only interrupt me for other doctors and for an emergency. That's when they interrupt me because I try to do everything in that one contact, in that one uh, experience in the room. And one little tip about getting your staff, what we've trained our staff to do is I just um, kind of open up the door a little bit, I crack the door, and that uh, indicates that I need something. So I try to stay in the room. So if I need a, uh, a cortisone injection, or if I need a pad, or if I need something else, I just crack the door and my staff is there to help. And then when I leave, they come in on the next uh, portion of the treatment to show stretching, foam rolling, to give them night splints, other DME equipment. So I try to do everything in that one encounter. The only encounter I don't do everything in one encounter is if I need to numb them up and then I go see another patient and then I come back in to do the procedure. Uh, something important for online reputation, um, we have to get good um, ranking online and that's real important. Usually most medical records, they can send out an email or a text message after to, to ask how you did. That's something very easy to set up. It needs to be automated. It can't be based on you sending it out to every patient uh, when you think about it, because you're not gonna do it. it. Automated is best. There are a couple ways of doing it. One is called Patient Pop. They have a website that after every patient interaction, they send them an email and ask them to go, how, how was the experience? And if it was a low experience, it goes to my office manager. If it was a high experience, and then it says, well, would you mind telling this to people out, uh, out in cyberspace, whether it be on, on, on Google or, or Facebook or something like that. Uh, once again, that's that follow-up email to ask for a review. It has to be automated. There's a lot of different services. Within Athena, the medical record we use, there's a lot of ways of doing that. You have to kind of research what's the easiest, but if it's not automated, it won't get done. Uh, also, for that's for patients and then for doctors, taking good care of their patients. That's all they really want you to do when they send someone over. Uh, take good care of their patients. Go meet them. If you haven't met the referring doctors that you're continually getting referrals from, go meet them. Take a day that you're a little bit slower, uh, block your patients, and just go introduce yourself. If you can, set up a, a lunchtime, bring lunch in, or uh, offer to do a little talk for them. Send notes in a timely fashion. That's obvious. If there's if, if there's a new referring doctor, then send them a thank you card. I'm, I'm opening up a new office now and there's a lot of doctors I don't know because they're new referral sources. So I'll send them thank you cards just to make an introduction, say I'm willing to see their patients. Call doctors about difficult cases. This is something I didn't do in the beginning and I would like that you 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 do this. Maybe you learn this, maybe you saw this with your attendings. But if there's a difficult situation, like an amputation, an urgent situation, I'm sorry, this might be cut off, or if they're admitted to the hospital, you you should um, call the doctor, okay? So take, and also take calls from doctor's office. I think that's important. Um, increasing efficiency for patient care, I would use something called uh, patient presentations. And this is something I'll share a little bit below here. Basically, all these are is PowerPoints on every diagnosis that you treat. So I have presentations on everything and I'll give these to you. You just kind of click on them. It's a PowerPoint. You can edit it however you would like. And I actually go over this and I'm constantly tweaking them to, to make them better. And, and then I, for example, plantar fasciitis, it has how I treat it. And that includes different visual examples of pictures. It slows you down when you're presenting because many times we are 10, 20, 30 minutes behind and you're having a discussion, maybe a preoperative discussion, and you skip over things because you're busy or you don't offer certain DME or certain other types of products because you're so busy. It includes something called patient protocols. And this is something a lot of doctors that are more experienced do naturally. And it's something that young doctors should develop. Like what's your protocol? How are you gonna normally treat these? I know things, there's variables, things can treat, but what's the order that you're gonna do things? What are the orders that your, your attendings do things? It helps you re remember, and it uses checklists. I think a checklists are important because uh, pilots use checklists, everyone use checklists. And I, and at the end of each presentation, you're gonna see some examples. I have a, a checklist of basically, these are all the treatment options you have for plantar fasciitis. Because certain people, they get better real quick. You may not even need this checklist. But other people, you've done three injections, you've done foam rolling, you've done physical therapy, you've done this, you've done that. And using the checklist, you can look at, well, you haven't done shockwave therapy, or you haven't done orthotics, or you haven't done a walking boot. 
Oh, and maybe we need to get a second opinion or additional imaging. And that, that's why I like these checklists. So I have checklists for everything. And then it also helps you to offer everything that you have in your, in your office. It includes durable medical equipment. Uh, it, it involves products. Uh, it includes different referrals, maybe to a, if you're doing a diabetic checklist, seeing a vascular surgeon, seeing a neurologist, seeing other type of referral. So that's for patient care. Patient education, I think patient education is very important because you, you talk about plantar fasciitis five billion times a day. But for them, it's the first time. So you have to slow down. You have to teach them. But you have to realize they're not going to remember anything in 48 hours, virtually nothing. You know, they're going to, how many times do they come in and we talk about plantar fasciitis and when they leave, all they think about is that, well, the doctor told me I was fat and you didn't even say that they were fat, but that's all they remember. So I find that uh, sending out patient handouts, I like videos personally. So I take these same presentations and I put them on a video, uh, very easy to do. Uh, and this is what I'm using right now is actually an add on to Google Chrome. So it's a Chrome add on. I think it's called a Screencastify or something like that. And it's pretty, it's real inexpensive and it saves it right to Google Drive and then you can upload it. Uh, Patient Education Genius is another good website, uh, patienteducationgenius.com. You can put patient education information. And actually, if you get to know them, um, there's a person that I use named Shelby. She actually, I sent over all my information and she separated it by categories and it made it a lot easier. So I just click what I want. It sends it to them via email or text message. It's great. Another product that that's, that that works well is called Postwire. You can find it at postwire.com. And basically what this is, is an individual website uh, that you make for each patient. It has your logo. It has some information. I'll put these links here underneath that you can learn more. It has your logo. It has other types of uh, resources. And you can choose what products or what uh, what videos, what uh, PDFs, what information you want to put on that page. And you make it for each individual patient. And I also have it for each individual patient, but I also have it for each individual diagnosis. So if it's a plantar fasciitis patient, I will just copy it, copy that information, and delete what I don't need. And I'm, I'm trying out different different patient education information. So hope you enjoyed it. This I'll put all this information either if you're doing the course, it'll be below the course and other sections, or if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, there's going to be some information underneath here on these uh, areas that I talked about. Okay, thanks.